Okay, so I, I, I lift R3, I write down the VSOR uh, kernel on R3, and I have this expression. Um, and then I want to integrate with respect to R prime and Z prime. So my, my goal is to do this dx prime. And I want to integrate with respect to R prime, Z prime, and theta prime, excuse me. And, uh, and what I'd like in the end is, uh, I'd like the result to involve uh, not the variables of integration. I'd like, I'd like to have an output that depends only on R and R and Z. And so, um, and so I'd like to replace these things. Well, well, so E Z prime is vertical, it doesn't matter where I am. That's the same as E Z, that's just the vertical uh, unit vector. So I replace this by that, uh, and I should have gotten rid of the prime here. Um, and, uh, and then the E R prime, uh, I'd like to express that in terms of, of E sub R and E sub theta. And so, um, and so I just uh, do this. This is sort of a, uh, it's kind of obvious. Um, if you write things down, this is just what it is. So uh, the the radial vector at the point uh, r at the point x x prime with coordinates r prime z prime theta prime. Um, I express in terms of the radial and the angular vectors that at a different point with coordinates r and theta and, and z. And, and it's just this. Um, and so I substitute this into here, let me say alpha is theta minus theta prime. And then um, when I integrate with respect to, um, so, so eventually I want to integrate with respect to uh, r prime, uh, z prime and theta prime, but, but um, in the formula I'm deriving, I have this k x e symmetric and the d r prime and d z prime are, uh, are still here. And so this part, is equal to the integral d theta prime, um, which is uh, d alpha because alpha is theta minus theta prime. Um, okay, so th the point is when I integrate with respect to alpha from zero to two pi, um, this part will vanish because it's integral by sine, um, just by parity considerations, and the other parts survive. And so that's uh, that's the only uh, slightly tricky part is this uh, is this replacing e r prime by the unit vectors in the R and in the fixed R and theta direction. So, so here we have a R and theta are fixed in R prime and so on are variables of integration. Um, okay, and so this should be the formula we have. We have a cosine alpha in front of the E sub R and then um, the other part appears here. And so, so here I'm just, uh, just rewriting things in terms of the polar points. Um, nothing, nothing fancy going on there. Okay, let's just check that. Uh, yeah, there, so there's a, a cosine alpha in front of z minus z prime and uh, r minus r cos alpha over here. Um, okay, and so and so the other one, the velocity is similar. What do we do? We uh, uh, sorry, that was the velocity. So for the um, for the uh, the stream function, um, uh, this is easier actually. So. Uh, uh, here, omega is a vector in the theta direction. And when we apply the kernel g to it, the, the Green's function for the Laplacian unit, uh, the fundamental solution for the Laplacian unit uh, in R3, we just, uh, that's just a, uh, so, so here g means a scalar function times the identity matrix. And so we again get something in the theta direction, multiplying the scalar r, r prime z prime. Um, and uh, and then down, down here in the denominator is just uh, the distance, uh, uh, yeah, right, distance to the one half between um, the, uh, the points x and x prime, which in terms of polar coordinates is, is this quantity. And uh, so again, um, uh, and again, this is wrong. Uh, sorry, this should have been a theta prime. And I replace uh, theta prime uh, as before by, uh, I express it in terms of the vectors at the fixed point with, uh, unit, with vectors E, R, and E theta. And then I, when I integrate with respect to, I, I, maybe I can call this alpha if I like, I integrate with respect to alpha and um, this will disappear. I'll get a cosine alpha someplace. And uh, that should be what we have um, here, there it is. Okay, and uh, so, and these, these factors of R, uh, well, the uh, the factor of r prime appears because I'm integrating 
uh, with respect to R, R prime d, R prime d, Z prime. And the factor of R appears because, because uh, of this one over R there. Anyway, you, you, can, you can see it's true. And then finally, um, what do we do? So the, the last assertion was a formula for the kinetic energy in terms of um, these. Uh, here it is. Uh, the kinetic energy in terms of this uh, axisymmetric Green's uh, function. And so the point is uh, when I integrate once, uh, say, with respect to, uh, I don't know what, R prime and Z prime, I integrate these guys, and this will give me psi of R Z. And, uh, and so this is really the integral of psi times omega. And, um, and uh, in terms of the, when we lift it to R3, this is, this is really the integral, the, the dot part of the vector psi with the vector omega. And, um, and so what we have to do is we have to just uh, justify this integration of parts, which says that the kinetic energy, the, the L2 norm of the velocity field is this um, dot product of psi with omega. And uh, so earlier I emphasized, uh, you know, in, in two dimensions, we don't have the energy, we have the pseudo energy, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. Here we might wonder, um, you know, so, so here I'm claiming that, uh, I'm claiming that on a half space, um, if I have even if you even have vorticity of, of, a, of a positive sign, of a, so uh, so say I have uh, you know the integral of omega is some uh, positive number. Um, this was the situation before where the where the uh, uh, in 2D where the energy would be infinite, but the pseudo energy was well-defined and fine. And so uh, here I'm asserting that even in this case, uh, the, the energy is finite. And the point is that, um, you know, this omega uh, corresponds to uh, the vector quantity, which is omega of R Z um, E sub theta. Uh, and, and so in R3, this is a, well, well, well we can see that this is a, a odd um, This is odd um, If I reflect through the z-axis Right, because that doesn't change um, this omega, but it, it changes the sign of the of the uh, theta of the unit vector in theta direction. So, um, and so using this, one can see. Uh, so, for example, um, if I again look at the lifted quantities, uh, and okay, I should have called this. I should call this uh, x1, x2, x3. <laughs> Sorry, that's a, a bit of a mess. Um, Um, so, for example, if I, look, if I look at u of x, we know what that is. That's this. Uh, so, so now, now I'm again considering the 3D picture. This is this integral, uh, this POSR kernel. And um, because, because of the symmetry of this, I can say, well, this is k of x minus x prime minus k of x d x prime. And um, this k is homogeneous of degree minus one. And so this decay is like, or, so, sorry, this, this decay is like, um, k decay is like a distance to the minus two. And so this decay is like, um, 
x to the minus 3 for x much bigger than x prime. Um, and I need a, uh, I need the vortex to here. Okay, and so for example, if, um, uh, if the vortex has compact support, and from this we can see that, uh, that the velocity also gets like, um, like uh, x to the minus three. And, uh, and similarly, um, psi will be, um, so again, the Green's function decays like one over distance, but because the integral is zero, uh, this will decay like distance to the minus two, we'll get the extra, extra decay. So, um, so for example, if I want to integrate my parts, This is all taking place in R3. This is, uh, okay, the curl, I'll, I'll write one factor of uh, U as the curl of Psi. And, um, and maybe I'll put in a, a cutoff function. So I'd, I'd like to justify the integration of my parts. Let's put in the cutoff function. Um, Okay, so uh, I'll do this. And, um, and so then the kinetic energy, uh, the integral of u squared is just the limit as r goes to infinity of, um, of uh, u squared times chi r. And so I can then integrate parts and I'll have a, um, I'll have a psi times the curl of u, which is omega times chi r. And I'll have terms involving um, maybe psi and the curl of chi. Dot uh, u. And um, using this decay property, uh, so this goes to zero as r goes to infinity. Because what's it look like? Well, I'm integrating over an annulus between r and 2r radii. And um, I know in that annulus, if, for, if, um, if I'm far, it, so, so here I'm imagining compact support. Uh, and one could then do this with a little more thought for, for, um, for rapidly decaying vorticity. But if we have compact support, if we're, if we're far from the support of the vorticity, then psi is like uh, x to the minus 3, u is like x to the minus 2. Um, Chi is like one over x, and so this this uh, just clearly is vanishing. Um, okay, and so then um, in so here we can relate the parts, and then when we uh, when we justify this, we just rewrite this in terms of um, uh, we re rewrite in terms of the forms we, we found above, and that gives us this one for the energy. Okay, good. So that's uh, that's um, this, and let me say also. Uh, so when we start proving this, so we have four nodes. We have, a, we have an explicit BOS of our kernel. Uh, it's a little bit it involves an integral. When we, when we start proving things, uh, we may have to, at certain points, uh, look at it more carefully and see really what's it look like. Um, and, and so uh, and to, to extract more information from these formulas. Um, there's some machine on the street making noise. I don't know if you guys can hear it. It's kind of distracting. But... Uh, uh, okay, anyway, so, here, so here quickly is an example of the way that we rewrite these, uh, these uh, forms. And so we, this is a, a one kind of classical way of rewriting the expression for the potential psi in terms of the vortex d omega. And, um, and so the, the, first, the first part of what I've written here is really just rewriting, um, is, is taking what I had before and rewriting it. Um, so, uh, Right. Now let's see. So, um, if if we if you compare the two forms about side by side, you could see, we could see pretty easily that that's the case. 
Um, and uh, but but the point is, I've, I've isolated the nasty integral, and I've I've uh, made its dependence on the argument s, um, which is this thing, as as uh, simple as possible. And so um, so we can rewrite uh, we can rewrite the formula for psi in this fashion, and then um, the assertion is that. Uh, is that there is something about asymptotic behavior of this function f of s as s goes to zero. And so s going to zero is like, um, is, so we should imagine the point r, z is fixed, and I'm, looking, and I'm worried about points r prime, z prime who are nearby. And, um, and so I sort of expect things to, to, to diverge, so I expect some kind of bad behavior. Um, this tells us how, how bad the behavior is. And so as s, s goes to zero, the distance, uh, and, and so what is so one thing to notice is that um, the relevant quantity s is the uh, the distance um, say the Euclidean distance between r z and r prime z prime, but but scaled by uh, this factor r r prime, and so if I'm um, and so it's scaled by something like the uh, how how far we are from the uh, vertical axis um, squared. Uh, okay. And so then the um, the point is that this this uh, s has a this f has a logarithmic singularity of leading orders here, um, and so uh, and so we can see that on, on small scales to leading order, um, it has the same uh, log. Uh, this kernel has the same logarithmic singularity as um, uh, as the uh, uh, the Green's function on R two. Um, here, however, it's, it has a weight. Um, so there's a weight, which is the, uh, um, again, this, it, uh, this thing related to the distance. If, if, I'm, if, I'm at a, if I'm at a distance r from the origin and I'm considering r prime nearby, then the square root of r prime is basically r, it is basically the square root of r squared, uh, which is the distance from the origin. Um, okay. And so, for example, when I remember when I write down the energy, the energy is, is the integral of this thing against omega. And so, um, and so, this the the energy will have these, will, will have this logarithmic singularity, uh, this logarithmic factor. But then there's a weight who, which is which would be so. If, if I imagine a blob of uh, of vortex d omega, concentrated at a certain distribution, then um, if I have r and r prime in, in uh, the support of this blob, then uh, if I have two points in support of the blob, then r and r prime will both be based on the distance of the origin. It's a small blob, and so I'll get um, some kind of uh, Factor similar to what we've seen before, um, but with but with this uh, distance appearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the proof very quickly. Uh, I'm not going to do it, but there there you, know, you can just do this by hand if you like. It's sort of a break the arm open pieces, uh, mess around with it. Um, it's and uh, we'll do things like this before. Uh, we'll do things like this in the future when we need um, we'll need slightly different information, and so we'll do it. But one way to do this is just to um, Express this cap function capital F in terms of certain special functions, the so-called elliptic intervals, and then appeal to known asymptotics for elliptic intervals as this uh, as the argument tends to um, tends to certain limits. And so uh, let's omit the details. But this this gives us some this gives us a bit more intuition into uh, what this kernel looks like than um, than the than just the plain formula from before. Uh, okay, so. Uh, okay, so here's what's next. Um, is, is, so basically, the um, the plan for studying vortex rings is going to be is that so, so every uh, every question we consider will have sort of analogs for what we've already done for um, point vortices on the plane. And so there we constructed these uh, rigidly rotating solutions that one could also do rigidly translating solutions of pairs of vortices. Uh, we constructed those things by uh, variational arguments. Um, we could have Done. We could have attempted PD arguments had we wished. I say more constructive arguments, and then we also go to dynamics. And uh, so I'd like to discuss the same things here. And so, and, and so basically we can see well it's like the order it's a lot like the equations, but there's some differences there. This weight, these weights bearing places and these uh, mess up the Biot-Savart type formulas and make things a bit uglier. In some cases, uh, quite a bit uglier. Um, okay, so the plan is. Well, also, uh, the plan is. Uh, 
uh, I'll discuss uh, vortex regions. So these would really be translating solutions, rigidly moving solutions, um, like the ones we had before. Uh, then we can ask, what if I, what if I have initial data who's merely con concentrated around, uh, who, who really is sort of, you know, doesn't have this special form that allows for perfect uh, translation without change of shape, but it's concentrated around a ring. And then three um, multiple. Uh, oops, what's that? I had the, what's the wrong. Um, so I want I want multiple. Uh, well, let, let's say uh, toward leapfrogging. Um, via a uh, via the approach developed by Mark Yoro and collaborators. Okay, <clears throat> for, so starting on this, I don't want to say this. So, so what I want to convince you about is that um, this problem is very similar to the one we considered in detail before and um, a similar technique should work and we don't need to uh, spend another two weeks on the details. So um, vortex rings. Are uh, say well, well, sort of what I mean is um, solutions of order of the form, say for me, of, um, I should give this equation, I, I, I should find some order. I have to find some abbreviation. Which I'll, I guess I'll introduce in a second. So the axisymmetric order without swirl. So this is A E W S um, of the form. Say, uh, let's say. V of X, uh, uh, okay, let's call it um, R and Z and T is some U of R and Z minus, I don't know what, V infinity T um, plus say some uh, V infinity E sub Z. So remember U is a vector and uh, this is what I want. And I'd like, uh, and I'd like uh, V to go to zero, S R Z goes to infinity. And so, uh, and so this is that I have, a, I have a fluid who's at rest at infinity. Um, and, uh, but if I look, um, uh, if I look, say, near the axis, I'll see that the fluid is, um, uh, so I mean, for every, for every time t, v goes from, goes from zero to infinity. Uh, so I see this, um, this, this, okay, in the, in the uh, rz half plane, I'll see a, um, uh, this picture translating upward with steady velocity. Okay. And um, and I want this to be such that the curl of U is like uh, some gamma times a delta function at some point p. Um, so uh, the curl is the curl is constant. And uh, so the equations for U will be well. Well, so so for V, I would have them. Um, V sub t plus V dot grad V. Uh, that would be, um, well, so, so V sub t is just uh, minus V infinity times D Z U uh, at, uh, and let me not write the argument. So it's, it's at the point uh, R comma Z minus V infinity. And then, um, 
when I look at this thing, the v dot grad v, I'll have a term involving u dot grad v. Uh, but then I'll also have a term where I have the dot part of this, this uh, and um, uh, or sorry, v, v infinity uh, e z. Okay, and I can see that these two terms exactly cancel. And because v is just u plus a constant, I can uh, I can replace this by uh, u. And um, and so the equations will just be uh, for u are just uh, u dot grad u plus grad p is zero and um, the one uh, the one change is that if if v goes to zero at infinity then u should go to u should go to minus uh, should go to oops what did I do I'm pondering okay, sorry um, you should go to v infinity e sub z at infinity okay uh, so this is the equation I'm solving and um, so remember, our, our, and so this is similar to what we did before. We look for a, uh, uh, so before we look for a solution of, this, so uh, this rotating solution of order translated to a stationary solution in a rotating frame. And so there the uh, condition was in fact a stationary solution of order um, with uniform rotation in the velocity field infinity. And, um, and so our strategy there was to uh, change it to a variational problem and solve the variational problem. And we'll do exactly the same thing here. So the strategy is is one will have a variational problem. For you, and then we'll solve it. Um, and uh, and so before what did we do? We uh, we wanted to construct this rigid rigid thing. We, we made a certain, uh, we imposed certain symmetry conditions to make sure that we got uh, some vorticity who, uh, you know, to, to, ha to have uh, things with this M fold discrete rotational symmetry. Um, I guess we don't need to do that here. Uh, and then we, we said, well, having imposed these symmetry conditions and also we, we put bounds on the support, but, we, but the main point was to uh, minimize, we wanted to, sorry, we wanted to maximize the kinetic energy with constraints on certain conserved quantities. And so the conserved quantities were the total vorticity and the second moment. And we also had a, uh, well, actually there are, there are two ways of thinking of it. One is we would either minimize in a rearrangement class, minimize among all rearrangements of a given vorticity uh, and the other, uh, uh, and so that's, that's a more restrictive formulation. The other less restrictive formulation was to minimize with some constraints which hold within a rearrangement class. But but uh, hold more broadly, and so constraints on the um, we had a concern on non negativity, but a concern on the infinity norm, um, and then we had some a couple of integral concerns. The integral was the integral of omega was one, and the and, and the second moment they said, okay. And so in this setting, for axisymmetric equations with swirl, we have basically we have sort of the same things. So we have a, we have a total energy, uh, which also the energy is uh, we've written it in more detail. Um, uh, earlier today, but we have a total energy who can be expressed in terms of vorticity. Um, we have, uh, okay, so the, the reason it was natural to rearrange, to minimize in a rearrangement class before was because um, uh, the because the flow was volume preserving and because the, uh, uh, and, and because the vorticity transported by the flow. Um, the, uh, uh, so, so, so this made it natural to, so these, these things preserve, these will keep you within a rearrangement class. Here we have something a bit different. We have that this is transported by the flow and it's not exactly volume preserving, it preserves, it preserves um, uh, well, sorry, it preserves uh, 
um, it preserves this. And, and so, uh, so the natural thing is to minimize not under a constraint that the vorticity is uh, uh, that uh, for a, re a rearrangement class, the vorticity, minimize under all rearrangements of a given vorticity, but minimize um, in this case, uh, we, we look at the, the quantity vorticity divided by the R and we want to uh, ask and we want to ask the, what's called a zeta. Uh, zeta, uh, we want to minimize for zeta being a, a rearrangement of some given a zeta naught, uh, omega naught over R. So um, the different character of the, of the um, conserved quantities in the setting give rise to different natural constraints. Um, okay, and then we have Again, the conservation of this and the conservation of that, that's, that's uh, almost exactly parallel to, um, to what we had before. And so the changes are, well, we, um, uh, so here's a, uh, here it is. Um, so the, we can express the kinetic energy here. Uh, this is a conserved quantity. We can express it in terms of the vorticity, but it has a different form of before, a different expression. And then, uh, uh, and then um, what else? Uh, well, okay. So let me write down the write down the problem. So the variational problem is so by analogy with before. Um, we, we co-rotating means we're looking for this, the uh, vortex in, in a rotating frame. Here we could call this co-moving or co-translating if we wished. Um, okay, so by analysis of that, let's see, we want to consider the problem. Uh, maximize. And well, actually, let's say, uh, let's, let's uh, set a zeta of R and Z to be the vorticity of R and Z divided by R. And so this is the thing who is translated, who, who, who is, who's, uh, who's, um, uh, uh, who, who's, who's transported by the flow. And so we want to consider is to uh, maximize and uh, we had some um, formula, I guess it was That doesn't matter much. Uh, so we integrate over the half space twice. And um, our formula before was maybe the G axisymmetric R, R prime, Z, Z prime. And then we had a omega and an omega. Let's see. Okay, and let's try that again. Um, we had uh, omega of R Z and omega of R prime Z prime. Uh, so that's R zeta R prime zeta of R prime Z prime. And then I think there's another R, R prime, D, R, D, R prime, D, Z, D, Z prime. Anyway, there's a formula. Um, and what we've seen is that basically uh, for R and R prime near each other, this looks like uh, the log of the distance uh, multiplied by a factor depends on the, uh, the log of the distance between, uh, between the two points. Sorry, if, if R, R prime, uh, if R, Z and R prime, Z prime are close to each other. 
this will have like a lot of the distance between those two points and multiplied by a factor involving R and R prime. Um, subject two. To, um, you know, what we want, uh, for example, a constraint on the angular momentum. For example, one and um, uh, zeta is a rearrangement. With respect to uh, diffeomorphisms that preserve this uh, weighted volume, sorry, R, uh, R, D, R, D, Z. of uh, some zeta not uh, non-negative. Um, okay, and so uh, this is one problem. This, this, is, uh, this isn't the version we consider, but um, I mean, we, we discussed this briefly. Uh, this is really the, in some way, the, the right problem to consider. But, um, the one we, the, the proof we gave. Um, it was just a bit, it's a technically easier, easier to solve. But we did, we really proved that, um, we proved in, in the other context that a solution to this problem would yield a, uh, okay, there was a coercion thing. And so here by essentially the same arguments, uh, one can verify that a solution of this problem will, um, if one can find it, would yield a, 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 a translating solution of the, of the, um, or of the, Axisymmetric order without swirl. Um, and so this is sort of the, the right problem. But uh, some technical challenges. And um, so problem two is. Um, is one where we is to maximize E uh, subject to um, okay and so then the constraints will be for example zero less than uh, zeta is less than, uh, before we said, one over pi epsilon squared, thinking of it as looking like a ball radius epsilon. Um, and uh, the integral of r zeta dr d zeta is one, and the integral of r zeta r squared dr d zeta is one. And uh, was there something else? Um, I think that was uh, that was that was it. Um, so so this is the uh, this is the analog of the problem we've considered before, the exact analog of the one for which we proved existence, except that now um, uh, this energy is different, and um, and uh, right. And, and the point is that uh, these are different because 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 we're um, in terms of vorticity. Uh, these were looking like the same constraints, but, but the, the natural quantity is this is this one who is um, uh, so 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 in particular we can see that a rearrangement of zeta will preserve the uh, the Alfani norm uh, as here, right? And so um, if I can if I consider uh, the earlier problem, looking at a rearrangement class that certainly preserves non-negativity and preserves the Alfani norm, um, and so uh, and um, and it will also preserve, uh, uh, so, so rearrangements, right? And so, so here I have exactly a, re a rearrangement with respect to this, uh, this uh, RD, RDZ 
thing. This, this is a, the right one either. And, and so we can see that a solution of problem two in particular will be a solution of problem one. Um, but also uh, it's, um, so, so in problem two, we have a bigger class of competitors. Okay, and so what I would like to argue, what I would like to assert is that, well, the, oh, well, let me say, why, why vortex rings? I, I, I showed you pictures of these moving things. Um, and uh, okay, here I'm kind of asserting implicitly that if we solve this variational problem, we will get a solution of the PD I wrote in earlier for the vortex ring. But, um, uh, but we, can, we can see on a sort of a heuristic level that, um, okay, vortex rings arise naturally, I think, because this is a problem of the sort are really the natural variational problems to consider. And so the, what do we have? We have a conserved energy, we have conserved, we have these few conserved quantities, including the, um, well, here they are. Uh, And, um, and then the rearrangement class, which implies conservation of this. And so the, uh, the, the natural thing to do is always to minimize or maximize energy with respect to uh, constraints on the other conserved quantities. And, um, and the point is that this last one will always give us Lagrange multipliers involving um, an R variable. And, and, and so some of, some of the, uh, the, the form of the, um, uh, the, the, the form of the Lagrange waters that appear due to these natural constraints uh, will, will just end up giving you uh, these, these vortex ring solutions. And that's, that's a computation which we, which we admit. But um, the, the uh, sort of fuzzy heuristic claim is that these uh, vortex rings arise not just naturally, but inevitably from the uh, symmetries of this problem. And um, let me stop now because it's 9.55 and uh, we can stick around for questions, but I do recommend uh, the talk in a few minutes at the Fields Institute Symposium of Jan Brunier, which would be very interesting. So uh, anyway, so I, I may say a bit more about these problems next time, but, but basically my, my claim is, you know, we understand this already. Same ideas. Okay, technicalities are different, but we'll move on to other stuff.